Well, I told you how, with my grandparents, we used to ring in the new year. How do you ring in the new year? Hmm? Some of you are like, I don't want to say that in church. <laughs> Sleep. So many people say, I was in bed by 9.30. I don't know what happened. How do you ring in the new year? Party with friends, okay? What do you do when it hits midnight? Say, thank God we can go to bed now, okay. <laughs> do you know how ringing in the new year began the concept of ringing? Church bells. Let me ask you, think for a moment. If you don't know the answer, you can probably figure it out, or the answers. What was the purpose of putting bells in churches? Call people to worship. That was one very important reason to call people to worship. What else? No ideas? For help, did somebody say? Help is in danger. If there was a fire, they rang the church bell in the middle of the night and people would come running. Absolutely. To call people to some sort of civic assembly. And we're talking centuries ago when most people did not own a cell phone, much less a rich swatch, or even have a clock in their homes. And so they looked to the church bells to tell the time of day. Part of that was to call them to prayer. Because the early church believed at three times a day you should stop and do what, you think? Pray, but not just pray, but pray the Lord's Prayer at morning, at noontime, and at evening. Now, church bells are interesting things. Um, the church that I served before coming here, and Phil Thompson is here this morning, who's a member of Harmony Church, had a bell and a steeple. There is no steeple on the building anymore because they moved the steeple from the old building when they built the new building. But the architect said steel trusses and the guys who built it said, ah, we don't need no steel, we can do it with wood. And the steeple came through the ceiling of the church right before I got there. So my first Sunday I stood up and proudly announced, for those of you who thought that the roof would fall in before you got a woman pastor, you were absolutely right. <laughs> But when they brought the bell down, the bells look small when they're up in the steeple, don't they? When they brought it down, it's huge. It's no wonder it wanted to come through the ceiling. And it now rests outside the church building. Church bells are now sort of controversial things because lots of organizations are suing churches for ringing the bells because they don't want to hear a church bell. And so churches have stopped ringing them on the hour. And some places prohibit the ringing of bells between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. because they disturb people's sleep. And when you hear bells ringing now, you don't think to run to see if there's a fire or you don't necessarily stop to pray. But they had a reason. And ringing in the new year, because the bell rang at midnight, was the way for people to know that we had changed from one year to the next. So that's where the expression ringing in the new year came. Now when they were ringing out the old year, because this was before automated bells, when they had you know Quasimodo up there pulling the string, they would toll as the year ended. What does tolling sound like? Bong, bong, bong. And what happens when bells are tolled? Usually bells are tolled in what circumstance? A funeral, a death. But then, once midnight struck, it was like wedding bells. The da 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 bing 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 and they were rung joyfully. Now, a lot of this was recorded, now you gotta remember, I was an English major, or as someone called me recently, English nerd. Some of this was recorded by Alfred Lord Tennyson in a larger poem called In Memoriam. But if you know any part of the poem, you know this part, and I wanna read it to you. This was written in 1850. How long ago was that? 170 years, but listen to how much of it seems to, pun intended, ring true today. Ring out wild bells to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light. The year is dying in the night. Ring out wild bells and let him die. Ring out the old, ring in the new. Ring happy bells across the snow. The year is going, let him go. Ring out the false, ring in the true. 
bring out the grief that saps the mind for those that here we see no more. Bring out the feud of rich and poor. Bring in redress to all mankind. Bring out a slowly dying cause of ancient forms of party strife. Bring in the nobler modes of life with sweeter manners, purer laws. Bring out the want, the care, the sin, the faithless coldness of the times. Ring out, ring out my mournful rhymes, but ring the fuller minstrel in. Ring out false pride in place and blood, the civic slander and the spite. Ring in the love of truth and right. Ring in the common love of good. Ring out old shapes of foul disease, ring out the narrowing lust of gold. Ring out the thousand years of war. Ring in the thousand years of peace. Ring in the valiant man and free, the larger heart, the kindlier hand. Ring out the darkness of the land. Ring in the Christ that is to be. 170 years ago, ring out party strife. Ring out the faithless coldness of the times. False pride in place and blood Ring out civic slander. We thought we had invented spite and party strife and civic slander, didn't we? But what are we to ring in? The larger heart, the kindlier hand. Ring in the Christ that is to be. Now, whether you rang bells on New Year's Eve or not, I think that to understand this passage, we ought to add a W to ring. If we're going to ring something out, what does it mean to ring with a W? <coughs> to twist. To twist for what purpose? To release something, to get rid of it. And in scripture, there is a line, rend your heart and not your garments, because ancient Jews, to express their grief and their despair and their distress, would rip their clothing. You know what the sound of ripping cloth sounds like, right? But then God says, I don't want you to rip your clothes, rip your hearts. And in American Sign Language, the sign for grief is your heart is here, and it's your heart being wrung out. Is that not a great description of what grief feels like and looks like when you grieve, your heart is wrung out of its feeling? So today, what we're going to do is something you've done before here something that I've done almost every year of my ministry for 35 years, which is to use John Wesley's covenant prayer. We've updated the language a little bit because we're starting a new year. Now, have you ever reaffirmed a covenant before? What kind of covenants get reaffirmed? Hmm? Weddings. Yes, and some people, when I have done sort of mass covenant renewals of marriage will come and have dinner and hold hands, and, and other people say, I'm not going to do that. Not because they're regretting the first covenant, because they said, I did it once, and once was good, and I haven't broken that covenant. But some people want to renew it regularly. What other covenants get renewed? Baptism. My seminary professor, Dr. Stuckey, and I guess he was still there when you were there, Anytime it rained and he saw you running across campus, he'd say, remember your baptism and be thankful. We renew our own baptismal covenant every time we baptize a child or a youth or an adult. We all renew that covenant together. Clergy, we renew our vows traditionally on what day of the year? Here's a trivia. If you ever go on Jeopardy, you'll know this one. Holy Thursday, the night of the Last Supper, is the traditional time when priests in the Roman Catholic Church and Protestant clergy will renew their vows of ordination. And trust me, there have been times in my 35 years of ministry when faced with something I didn't want to do or something I didn't think I could do, I would literally get out my ordinal and read my vows again out loud. Well, there are other covenants like the HOA, the Homeowners Association, <laughs> which you have to re-sign every year. But covenant is part of life. And what was the basic covenant that God gave to Abraham? I will be your God. You will be what? My people. I will be your God. You will be my people. But people couldn't take that at face value. 
And so Joshua has to remind the people what God has done to bring them through horrors and tragedies, mostly of their own making, but to bring them to salvation and newness of life. And then we had that wonderful temple where you could go and you could either bring the gift of poor people when you had a baby, like Mary and Joseph, the two pigeons or turtle doves, or an animal to be slaughtered because the smell of that burning incense and, and God apparently liked a good barbecue because God loved the smell that came from those sacrifices. But we are under a new covenant now. The blood that saved us is not the blood of bulls or goats. It is the blood of Jesus Christ offered freely for our sake and for the sake of the world. And Jesus comes to the table the night before he gives up his life. He comes to the table and he knows that Peter is going to deny knowing him. He knows that Judas has already betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. He knows full well the others are going to run. And still, what does he do? He says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Trouble with a covenant is it takes two parts, right? Two members, two entities joining together and agreeing on something. God's covenant to us in Jesus Christ has never failed. We can't always say that we've kept up our end of the bargain, can we? And so this morning, I'm going to invite you, before we come to the table, using words that are almost, well, actually, they're older than the words that we read from Tennyson. And I want you to take seriously the covenant that you're making. So if you don't think you're ready to make it, don't read the words. Read them silently, but don't say them out loud. Don't make a promise that you can't keep. That's what I always say to people. If you came to me or your children came to me and said they wanted to get married, and I was like, wonderful, let's sit down and do some premarital counseling. And I said, you know, faithful to each other until we are parted by death. And one of them said, well, you know, maybe four out of seven days. Would you want me to do that wedding? Or the folks who come and they want their baby baptized, but they don't want to be part of the church, the body of Christ. That reduces it to a symbol instead of a sign of the presence of God in our midst. So if you want to read over the words before we get there, read them over. But what I'm going to ask us to do is to make that covenant our own. It's not terrible, and I pray this prayer through the year too. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be exalted or brought low. Let me do the work that you've called me to do or let me step aside to let others. It's not always easy to step aside and let others, is it? I freely give myself to you, God. Wonderful words if we mean them and intend to live them. Wonderful promises to make so that we can truly, truly offer something new and fresh and full to God, our Savior. Then what we'll do is we will seal that covenant with the new covenant in his blood. We will celebrate our first meal together as Christ's family called Epworth Church. We will come to the table where we will taste the wine or juice as it may be of the new covenant poured out for us and for many for the forgiveness of sins. But before we do that, what are we called to do? We confess our sins. That's the time what I would like you to do is wring out your heart. That's why we confess. We don't confess so we feel bad or guilty or icky because too many people think Christianity is about making us feel bad about ourselves. It is not about that at all. It is about accepting the new life and grace. But just as a cup cannot be filled if it's already full, we've got to sometimes empty things out. So I would like you to think to this morning about what you need to get rid of in your life. And I'm not talking about pound cake or macaroni and cheese here. We could all do with a little fewer carbs in our lives, right? Dang it. But ring out anger, resentment, doubt. What we really need to ring out is fear. We need to ring out fear over what the future holds for us. If we wring all that out, we will have room for the grace that God will pour into us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
because this is what he wants to give us, the new covenant sealed in his blood so that we might know new life, new life. Too many Christians wait till they're dead to experience resurrection. But for us, the moment we understand the depth of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, the moment we understand that our worst mistake or intentional action is not greater than God's power to redeem, the moment we realize that, or sometimes if we realized it years ago, but we need to remember it, is the moment that new life begins. So let's ring out the old and ring in the new, and let us let Christ make all things new in this year, 2020. Amen.